Shalom Lekulam and welcome to our weekly study in the Torah portion. This week's Torah portion is Parsha Shemini. And in this Torah portion, we're going to be uh, focusing mostly on the commands for food that is kosher, the kosher laws, and uh, identifying these animal species that are permissible and those that are forbidden to eat, and what do they actually mean according to Kabbalah. Uh, also, we're going to be talking about uh, how these parsha connect us to the level of Bina, and how these parsha also uh, help the people of Israel uh, be the ones that are commanded basically to dif differentiate between the impure and pure. Okay, so I hope you join me after the introduction so we can start our study on Parsha Shemini. Welcome back. This week's Torah portion is uh, Parsha Shemini. Parsha Shemini is found in the book of the Torah called Beikra. Uh, that is Leviticus chapter 9, verse 1 to chapter 11, verse 47. As always, we're going to uh, have an overview of what the Parsha is all about so we can have a uh, or study within the context of the parsha okay so in this parsha we're gonna see that on the eighth day and this is where the name shemini comes from you know when it said by yom hashemini uh following the seven days of the inauguration of aharon and his sons uh to start acting as priests as kohanim a fire came from God basically to consume the offerings that were in the altar and then the Shekhinah the divine presence uh, started to dwell in the sanctuary that was built in the desert tabernacle uh, in this part also we're gonna find uh, another I would say an, another thing that happens uh, and 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 that is another uh, kind of a lesson within the, the Parsha Shemini, because here we have, uh, believe it or not, in this Parsha we have some of the concepts of reincarnation and uh, also we have the concepts of uh, uh, of Kashrut and the concepts of uh, dividing between profane and what is holy, okay? But in this part is, ref is referring basically, you know, to Nadab and Avihu, who were sons of Aharon, and they offer strange fire before God, and uh, they die before the presence of, of God. And then, if we study, you know, uh, Kabbalah more in depth when it comes to uh, reincarnation, we're gonna see that these two characters that we see here in the story of the Torah, you know, Nadab and Avihu, will reincarnate within the soul of Pinchas and from there uh, also we're gonna see that uh, these souls are related also to Eliyahu Hanavi as well so this is the thing you know Aharon after this is totally silenced and uh, and in the face of this tragedy he doesn't complain basically about what happens and 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 it's something kind of strange for 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 him because he lost two sons but Aaron being in the level that he was, he saw what was going to happen in the future. He saw that what, that what looks like a tragedy at that moment was actually something good for the future. Okay? And there are many explanations whether it, uh, Nadat and Avi who did the right thing or they did it you know, carelessly or they did it in order to approach the Creator uh, uh, in a way you know, that, that was going to be like faster for them to uh, create a tikkun in creation. Uh, there are different opinions about that, and that 
something that we will not study in this parsha. You know, we're going to concentrate mostly on the kosher laws. And uh, what we're going to see also in this parsha is Moshe and Aharon. Uh, they disagree and to point on, on when it comes to uh, an offering, you know, the law of regarding the offerings. And we're going to see that Moshe consists to Aharon. And basically saying that Haron was right in, 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 in what Haron was saying about this uh, uh, offering. Uh, then we're going to see that God commands the kosher laws, identifying uh, species of animals that are permissible to eat and those that are forbidden to uh, consume. And then they go you know, to more detail, land animals that may be eaten and uh, go into specifics about uh, they must have split hooves and also shoot their cut. Uh, fish must have fins and scales. And a whole bunch of other list of non-kosher birds is given, which we're going to study them in detail, what they actually mean. And a list of kosher insects, four types of locusts actually, and we're going to study those as well. And uh, also, in uh, what we're going to see is that in this parsha includes the laws of purity in specifically uh, the purifying power of the waters of the mikvah and uh, we're gonna see also that the people of Israel are basically commanded you know in fact uh, uh, it says uh, at the end it says you know that this is very cry 1146 this is the Torah of the animals and birds and all living bees which swarm in the water and the living things which swarm on the land so basically saying the Torah is mentioned in the Torah and the reason I mentions Torah is because uh, to make sure that you understand that the Torah uh, has the same root as Yora, Yora is a Yod, Vav, Resh, Hey and that means that basically that the Torah will basically take you to the proper path and prevent you from faltering. Uh, any other path, you know, always have a left and a right. The Torah is a straight path. And when the Creator mentions, you know, the Torah, when it says this is the Torah, you know, basically sot, torot, torat, you know, uh, basically saying this will not make you go straight, right? And then Vayikra 1147 says, you know, and to separate between the impure and pure and the animal which can be eaten and the animal which should not be eaten. Uh, so this is basically the commandment for those of us who are called Israel to divide between what is holy and what is not holy. So this is basically the Parsha, uh, an overview of the Parsha, so we can have our study uh, in context. And uh, as always, we're going to be studying our Parsha uh, based on the based on the comments of Ramchal and the comments of the Abir Yaakov, or Rabbi Yaakov Abu Hasair, okay? So we're going to start with Ramchal uh, and basically Ramchal is going to connect us to, to, to what we need to talk right now which is this Parsha, Shemini uh, the word Shemini basically means, you know, the eighth, the eighth. What, what is the eighth? Bayon HaShemini, the eighth day. And, the, you know, in the eighth day, Moshe called Aharon and his sons and the elders of Israel, all right? Uh, what, why the Torah specifically here says, you know, that it was on the eighth day that this happened? And the reason for it, for it is the following. Everything that we need to correct it's basically based on the seven lower sefirot of the tree of life, right? So we're talking about Hesed, Geburat, Tifaret, Nesak, Hot, Yesof, Amahut. And these are basically the Midot that we need to correct in order to connect to Bina, right? Bina is considered that eighth day. Why it, Bina is considered that eighth day? Because seven days are basically that that we need to correct in order to transcend. So the eighth is basically transcendence beyond 
what is established, right? Uh, also, is considered all, uh, as uh, the fiftieth gate when it comes, you know, to the gates of uh, understanding that we have here. And in these days, when the uh, Shemini, you know, uh, Shemini in during the Omer, Shemini brings basically meaning to the Omer as well because we are correcting these seven traits times seven, right? 49 days basically on the eighth day uh, or in this case the 50th day Shavuot we attain uh, basically that level of Matan Torah which is the giving of the Torah and is the 50th day basically that day that we receive Matan Torah so this Parsha connects us to that energy of Bina so that's how we need to see it but it's telling us how basically within this uh, basically system of the seventh we need to basically behave or we need to do certain things in our physical life in order not to diminish the light that we have and in order to achieve a connection with the light of Bina. And the light of Bina is none other than the life of Hokma that is enclosed with Or Hasidim, which is uh, Hokma cannot go directly to Serampin and Mahud. Hokma needs to basically clothe itself with Or Hasidim, with the light of Bina. Okay, so this is what we need to basically connect to. Uh, we are basically preparing. Through the, with this parsha and through the counting of the Omer to receive that light from above called Torah. Okay? So, Ve'yehi vayon ha-shemini kra Moshe ve'aharon ve'halavanev u le'seknei Israel. The eighth day Moshe called Aharon and his son, the elders of Israel. And uh, in in the commentaries of Ramchal said Rabbi Akiva said that the people of Israel are compared to a bird, just as the bird cannot fly without wings. Also, the Bene Israel cannot accomplish anything without the elders. Uh, also, there is a, another deeper meaning that the people of Israel perform mitzvot. And uh, the presence of Tuma at the times prevent this misbot from exerting the proper influence of the spiritual realms. The strength or the spiritual strength of the elderly, you know, this, this uh, uh, Sagnim, uh, literally carries and elevates the acts of the sons of Israel to a proper place in the spiritual realm. So this is uh, what is called elevating the worlds, okay? The Kohanim, they were given the task of serving in the Mishkan, the Tabernacle, and the elders, they were basically called into this assembly uh, to make sure that this process of installing the, the, the Kohanim uh, will be properly uh, done and it will be devoid of any influence of the Tuma, the Tuma meaning unholiness. Okay, so that's why also we're gonna see that on the eighth day, Aaron was commanded the following: you know, take for yourself a calf for a sin offering. Basically, it says here, you know, that take for yourself a calf um, was to rectify himself is to rectify Aharon, we don't rectify himself, and to make sure that he will subdue the spiritual prosecution that was, or, or this judgment that was against him for his role when he helped in making this uh, idol in the desert called the calf. You know, the, the, when the scene of the golden calf happened, Aaron was part of it. And uh, because 
Aharon as a priest represents the force of Hesed, the force of mercy. He needed to do this in order to sweeten that kind of judgment. So, then we're going to go to Vaikra 11.2, where it says, speak to the Bene Israel, saying that this is the Chaya, this is a living thing, that you should eat from all the behemoth, the animals, which are in the land. And then uh, in, in the commentaries, he's asked, you know, why does this uh, pasuk, this uh, verse, describe the animals as haya? And then it finishes describing them as behema, uh, behemoth in this case. And it says that it's, it's, it's basically saying, you know, that the physical form is a microcosm of the spiritual realm. You know uh, the physical form of man. Uh, basically, man was created by Selim Elohim in the image of God. This is from Bereshit 1:27, and man is given behemoth, uh, basically the animal, which is which are secondary in significance, in order to reflect the outer aspects of kedusha, of holiness, of holiness in the physical realm to help him in the physical realm. This is why we, even though we are spiritual beings, we are enclosed within this animal body that we have. And uh, the same system of Kedusha also exists in, this, in the opposite system called the system of Tumah, the system, system of unholiness. So pure animals represent the outer aspect of Kedusha. And the non-pure represent the outer aspects of Tuma. Kedusha is referred to as Hayat's life, and the Tuma is referred to as Mot, um, which is death. And we may understand then this way, you know, this is from Devarim 32.15. See, I have placed before you today the life and the good, the death and the evil. Okay? The pure, the Hemot, which we may consume are referred to as Haya, literally life, for they emanate from Kedusha, which is the source of life. And these are the animals that we can eat because they are rooted in Kedusha. Okay? So, in Vaikra 11.2 says the animals that are considered kosher basically have two signs. They must shoot their cord and they, they must shoot their cord and they must have split hooves. These are the two signs. Uh, what do they signify? It says, you know, that our actions and deeds influence and elevate the spiritual realms, causing a reaction in the form of the divine influence that we receive. Uh, this system that that actually elevates, you know, all these. Uh, energies that we create down here in order to create a reaction from the from from above basically what is called you know elevating the female waters in order to receive a reaction an answer is elevating our prayers basically um, that's basically what is called kedusha and this is why these two signs of pure animals associated with kedusha are as follow the shoeing of the cut is a reflection of actions being elevated and having an effect in the spiritual realm while the split hooves represent openings which make way for the spiritual realms to influence the physical and uh, then he goes to reference uh, Ezekiel 1 7 in which it says you know like the soul of a calf you know that the Hayoha cottage the holy uh, animals that Ezekiel saw in the in the vision, you know, they have basically split hooves as well, which means that the influence to enter into the lower world, they or they have this influence to enter the, the lower world. Uh, the hooves of the spiritual higher were split, allowing allowing for a clear passage, basically. And uh, 
Then it's going to mention that there are four impure animals. And these four impure animals are going to represent or represent four spiritual roots of Mahut, or lower spiritual roots of Mahut. And these kingdoms that are basically rooted in these uh, non-kosher animals um, are basically what we call the four exiles of Israel. So, for example, Gimel, which is a camel, represents the Babylonian kingdom. Then, Shafan, which is a hyrax, represents Media or Persia. Arnabat is a hare, uh, represents the Greek kingdom. And then Hasir, which is a pig, represents Edom. Each of these kingdoms, they have power and the way they work is that one kingdom basically drags the other one into power. They depend on each other in order to, to rise into power and, and to be basically powerful. And uh, we find that the succession of these kingdoms are basically in the word gara which can be also understood to drag from the world uh, garar the first three animals the one that represent uh, the babylonian kingdom persia and the greek camel hyrax and hare uh, represent three kingdoms and they share the same sign of purity they each shoot their cut but do not have split hooves each of these kingdoms drags in and gives rise to a successor. The one exception is the last kingdom. That kingdom is the one of Edom, which is represented by the pig. It has split hooves, but does not show it, the, its gods. And therefore, the Torah emphasizes about, but it does not show its god. Okay? And that's what you're going to see, you know. The Hayagaralo Yagor, you know, so the word Gara is there. Gara means, you know, to drag. Um, so we may derive from here that the final kingdom, Edom, Lo Yagar, will not drag any other kingdom. This is the last kingdom, basically. And what is this kingdom? We are basically in what is called the exile of Roman exile, actually, since uh, the Roman exile the people from Israel, we're still in that exile. We haven't actually fully come back to the land of Israel. And in fact, you know, the land of Israel is still considered that is at the level of the nations until all, basically, Israel completes what is called its purification properly, then the land will be elevated higher and higher. Then it will become, you know, the holy land like it's supposed to be. Uh, and, and, and the reason is because we still, not only physically, but also mentally, in this uh, final, uh, basically, uh, in this final phase of, of redemption, which is called the exile of Edom, of, of Rome, in this, in this uh, case. And uh, it says uh, here that people may ask why if the more significant of the two signs of purity is having split hooves, and this is the first sign the Torah mentioned, then why the pig, which is the lowest of these uh, impure animals, has only with this one sign, you know? And there are two explanations. First, for the sake of the sons of Israel, the order of the Bnei Israel to basically, in order for the Bnei Israel to continue receiving spiritual influence, were in exile in the lands of the people of Edom. The hoof would need to be split to facilitate the passage. Being immersed in the field of Tumah of Edom without this open passage of influence throughout this most dangerous exile will possess a serious threat and danger to the Bnei Israel. Second, for the world to be rectified following the fall of Edom will require spiritual influence following into or flowing into the world. This will 
enlighten many people of Edom to recognize the true God and live the idolatrous way, the split hoof is an opening through which the influence will be able to pass to rectify the Bene Israel, to rectify Edom, and achieve what is called Gamartikun, the end of Goreshen, the rectification of the whole world. Okay, so this is why uh, that animal, which is considered the lowest, have that sign in in the feet, right? Okay, so what we're gonna do? We're gonna pause there with Rampal. We're gonna continue with Rampal uh, at the end of our study. And what we're gonna do is we're going to go to. Chapter 10, verse 8 to 11, when it says, uh, Hashem spoke to Aharon, saying, Intoxicating wine you shall not drink, you and your sons with you, when you come to the tent of meeting, that you not die. This is an eternal statue for your generations, to distinguish between the holy and the profane, between the impure and the pure, and to teach the children of Israel all the statutes that Hashem has spoken to them through Moshe. So, when here mentions you, you shall not drink, uh, what Kabbalah tells us is uh, that drunkenness is considered basically um, a sin in the sense that in drunkenness in this case means a person that is drunk with power, drunk with materialism. And, uh, and a person that in this case also as a Kohen or as a teacher of Israel, is drunk with this type of uh, desires, uh, which are basically egoistic desires, this person basically cannot be expecting students that will behave uh, holy because the students will do the same thing, they will fall. And uh, in Avot 117 says, you know, it is not study but action that is most important. You know, of course, study is good, but it's actions that actually. Uh, do the thing you can study all you want but if your actions do not reflect what you're studying then the study means nothing it's not important okay so in this way we can understand Hashem spoke to Aharon the name uh, Aharon has a numerical value 256 which is the same as Hamora he, one who guys or one who uh, Hamorer, actually, one who guides or one who teach, referring to one who guides other Torah scholars as well as the general community. Okay, so we got Aharon and Hamore, the teacher, basically, the teacher. Intoxicating wine you shall not drink. Wine, and this is according to Sohar, volume 1, uh, page 239b. The word Yain, wine, has a numerical value of 70, alluding to the Torah. The Torah can be expanded or explained in 70 ways. But the way the, the, the verse implies that you should not drink wine referring to the Torah in a way that is intoxicating, like a person who uh, basically goes or strays uh, away from the path. A person who study and learn Torah uh, must do the mitzvah, must fulfill the mitzvah, and not just teach it, but also you know participate on that kind of correction called mitzvah. Uh, you and your sons with you, you know, this means you know that not only you, as a teacher, but also your students. When you come to the tent of meeting, uh, the tent of meeting is not only the tabernacle at the time, but in this case, you know, it's also the congregation that you participate in. That you not die, basically that you will be able to inherit the next world, the Olan Haba. This is an eternal statue. So this is basically telling us that this is uh, for generation, that is study and action, the most important thing. To distinguish between the holy and the profane, a person needs to practice what he has learned and know the difference between what is good and what is bad, right? And that's why the Torah has given us these commandments that we practice in order to distinguish between what is holy and what is secular. And if we don't do this, then as Mishlei, Proverbs 30, 23 said, 
a maid servant who inherits the place of her mistress. Basically, this demon angel called Lilith will take the place of the Shekhinah, the holy presence of God within the congregation of Israel. And to teach the children of Israel the statutes that Hashem has spoken through motion. In other words, generation after generation, you not only have to study the Torah like we're doing, but also practice and fulfill the mitzvah in a way that it will be giving you merits and will give also merits to the people that you're teaching. Then we're going to chapter 10, verse 16. Moshe inquired insistently about the goat of the sin offering, for behold, it had been burned. And in here, in this uh, verse, what we're going to see is that Moshe inquire and inquire. It's a proper uh, uh, translation because it says, you know, Darosh and then Darash. And inquire, and inquire about the goat of the sin offering, and it had already been burned. He was angry with Eliezer and Itamar. These are the two sons of Aharon uh, that remain after uh, Aharon lost his other two sons. And the word Darosh ends one line, while the other word Darash begins the next line. So basically, this here basically there's kind of like a like a division in there or a separation in there the words basically repeats itself or is mentioned or is spoken differently so we're gonna have darosh and darash in here and we're gonna see what this means these two uh words are actually right in the middle of the torah so here in these two words, what you're going to find is the middle of the Torah. Um, there's also another letter, the letter Vav, that is going to be found in another uh, word. That is the exact letter in the middle of the Torah. That's regarding numbers of letters. In this one, regarding numbers of words, these two words are exactly in the middle of the Torah. Okay. So the first word, uh, Darosh. It's written at the end of the line. It represents a humble man who has reached the very end of the line. Despite this person be poor, he or she uh, inquires about Torah, learns it, fulfills the misfot, and does not neglect the misfot. Even if he becomes wealthy and finds himself, you know, in the head of the line, which is the darash as leader of uh, others due to the uh, status that he has gained, he continues to inquire about the Torah and learn it, represented by the second word, you know, Darash, as we mentioned. So we can explain uh, the way that it was uh, uh, explained in the Talmud, Ta'anit 7a, says the Torah does not endure except within a person who is lowly of spirit, humble spirit, okay? So I think that low means, you know, a person that is basically depressed or anything like that. It's a humble person, a person that does not have an inflamed ego, okay? And this is why the Torah is compared as water that flow downwards. Remember we mentioned that uh, what does Matan Torah means? Matan Torah means the giving of the Torah, means a flowing down of that towards us, okay? So that's something to keep in mind as we study this Torah. So the first letters in the first word, uh, Dorosh, or Darosh here, are, that are written basically at the end of the line, are vocalized with a holam. And they are pronounced basically as Rosh. So the holam is up here. And so these two letters, Resh and Shin, basically is Rosh, which means head. The letters in the second word here, then we're going to see here, uh, they're written at the beginning of the following line, vocalized with a patah. They're pronounced as rash, and rash means poor. So it's kind of like, here you're supposed to be a poor man, right? humble man. 
and yet here, which is supposed to be the head, a person high status, you know, a high high status and and, and and a title basically, it has the word um, basically for poor. And basically saying that a person acts in, in humility, like the word darosh implies, which at the end of the line, the Torah will endure within this person, and ultimately this person will become a rosh, okay? A head. Uh, basically a person that's going to be a, a Torah scholar. But if the person inflames, you know, it's his ego, and... Uh, and he, he started thinking or she started thinking about himself or herself, you know, that he's better than anybody else because of the knowledge that he's gaining and all that. Then like the word Darash in the beginning of the next line, ultimately that person then, the Torah, the light of the Torah will not endure in this person. This person will become poor. So if you're humble, you become a head, uh, a teacher, a person that shares the light, a friend who shares, you know, with other friends and love other friends. And then when you become that head of the line, the Torah leader, and you inflame yourself, then remember that that word, which darash, uh, has also within itself the word poor. So you would be poor of spirit if you don't uh, learn from these two words. Uh, and, and their meaning. Uh, then Rabbi Yaakov Haseira mentions that in the beginning of Shara Ruach HaKodesh, this is from the writings of the Ari, and Shara HaGil Gulim, it's mentioned that the Torah contains four levels. This is the Pardes level, which is uh, Pashat, Remes, Drosh, and Sod. Uh, Pashat basically is a simple, literal meaning. Remes is basically allegories, you know, uh, and, and uh, basically allusions and things like that. Then you got the rush. The rush basically is an inquire. And you can see, you know, it's the same word that we have here. Uh, it's an inquire. It's a midrashic meaning, you know, uh, taking an example basically of, uh, of, uh, of other stories or similar stories. Sot pronounced with a long O, you know, Sod, as a, uh, it's a secret, the mystery, the mystical meaning behind it is the inspiration, revelation, okay? So, Rabbi Yaakov says that the the end of the line, the Darosh, the Darosh, belongs or represents the level shot which is the surface okay it's humble you're learning it but eventually it's going to take you to the next level and those next levels are actually within the next word which is darash from darosh to darash and in darash since the shin is mentioned with the same parts of the mouth as the samek then you can exchange them sin and shin and even shin can be uh, pronounced as sin if if the this point over here is basically on the first uh, yod over here of the shin. Uh, that means that this, even though this one represents you know the peshat, this one will take you to the remes, to the drash, and the sod. So you got uh, drash, remes, and sod in this word. Okay. And he says here, I'm going to read it, you know, because it makes more sense to read it and for me to explain it in my own words. Uh, the Jerusalem Talmud in Pea 2 4 says that all the Torah insights ever to be conceived from the day the Torah was given until the end of time were revealed to Moshe. Thus the world, the Rash, 
or the Darosh actually, inquire at the end of the line alludes to the end of all generations. In other words, it alludes to all the Torah insights that will ever be conceived by all the Torah scholars until the end of time. They were already revealed to Moshe, who was at the very beginning when the Torah was given, alluding to by the word Darash, inquire, the second word, that appears at the beginning of the line, of the next line. Okay, so keep this in, in mind about these two words. These words, remember, they're right there in the middle of the Torah. So you can divide the Torah between two, and you're going to find uh, Darosh, finish the first half, and then Darash starts the other half of uh, the Torah. Um, so this part is very interesting, it has a lot in it, a lot in it. All right, so verse, uh, actually chapter 11, verse 9 and 10. This may you eat from everything that is in the water, everything that has fins and scales in the water, in the seas and in the streams. Those may you eat, and everything that does not have fins and scales in the seas and in the streams, from all teeming things in the water and from all living creatures in the water, they're an abomination for you. So this is where we're going to start studying now in detail, you know, the loss of cash root according to Leviticus 11 and in this case we're going to see that even though we're talking about animals not only are mitzvot or of cash, uh, loss of cash root that we need to follow but also there's a deeper meaning uh, as well something that has to do within ourselves okay something that has to do with these energies within ourselves as well so So let's look at, at each verse. This may you eat from everything that is in the water. In other words, this means, you know, there are new ideas that you may derive from Torah, which is compared to water. So let me, so but mine in the waters equals Torah. Just to give you an idea of what we're going to be explaining now. By a mime in the seas is the Mishnah. In the streams, Ben uh, Halaim, uh, U Ban Halaim, uh, Talmud and commentaries, and then you know, Aten, the whole, uh, those you may eat, permitted to learn from. Basically, you have Torah, Mishnah, Talmud, and commentaries, those are basically the things that you're permitted to learn from. And this is what he's talking here. He's talking about fish, basically, but it's uh, at the same time telling us about the story of the Torah. And uh, there's a whole other explanation when it comes to the fish. That the fish, basically, you have uh, fins, basically, on one side and the other one that represents the right and the left side. And then, you know, that the fish in the middle represents, you know, the the center line, that kind of stuff. But we're not going to study that we're going to study according to what Rabbi Yaakov Hasid is explaining to us in this commentary. It says, everything that has fins and scales refers to insights that are being upon the things and the knowledge, you know, that we get from, from, from basically uh, the knowledge that we get from these commentaries and these writings and all, and all these things, you know, that we have. And they're similar to scales and fins that support and protect the fish you know so this thing support and protect uh, the knowledge that we get from our uh, from, from our sages in the water by mine uh, this may be found within the Torah itself but your mind in the seas refers the proof that is found in the Torah now you can also find it in the Mishnah and then the or actually U ban Haliam Haliam in the streams. This refers to proofs brought from other commentaries, later commentaries. And then it says, you know, Otam Toholu, those you may eat. If a person's, you know, uh, thoughts, the original you know, thoughts that we mentioned before, I'll build upon the proofs of these sources, the Torah the Mishnah, Talmud, and the commentaries, then this person can, as it says in Proverbs 9 and 5, come and partake of my bread. Basically, the person can come and enjoy this type of, uh, of uh, basically, in this case, fish, or in this case, you know, the thoughts that he has in his mind. 
and everything that does not have fins and scare and, and scales. So the person should not reflect upon his Torah, uh, the, the thoughts of Torah, uh, when they are built in chaos and confusion. Everybody knows, you know, that we have within ourselves a force. This force is called uh, Amalek, which is doubt, and we shouldn't be basically giving power to that kind of force. Okay. By a meme uh, in in the seas refers to the Mishnah and Gemara as we mentioned, and then the streams refers to the later commentaries. From all teeming, teeming things in the water, from all living creatures in the water, this refers to the person's original thoughts that are not founded in reliable sources, and these are considered basically these uh, lowly creatures teeming in the water. And uh, in this case, it's, it's mentioned that such ideas basically uh, create empty heavens and barren lands and give strength to an angel called Samael. And then not only to this angel, but also to Lilith, the evil female angel who reigns together with Samael. And the word uh, Sheretz, teeming things, refers to Samael, while the word uh, nefesh haya, living creature, refers to the evil female angel Lilith. Okay, in other words, in other words, these two evil angels live from this water and gain the strength from this uh, water. Remember, water represents mercy, so that's why you're gonna see Samael has at the end the name of God because it feeds or is fed somehow, is kept alive by that somehow. And it says they are abomination to you, means that these ideas that you have in your head that are feeding these two angels are abomination. So then Rabbi Yaku Haseira says, May Hashem in his great mercy save us from all error and forever protect us from stumbling. Amen. Then verse uh, chapter 11, verse 13 and 14. This shall be an abomination to you from the birds. They, they may not be eaten. They are an abomination, the eagle, the kite, the osprey, the kestrel, and the various kind of vulture. So in this case, the verse actually, or the verses actually are talking about the pursuit, the pursuit of wealth and physical desires. And uh, these things basically make people, the people's eyes, you know, kind of blind their hearts become like stone and they basically forget about God and his creation and they don't care about anything else other than just working for this uh, evil urge to basically get things that they want let's uh, Go verse by verse. This shall be a nation to you from the birds. The word of, which uh, of means uh, birds, alludes to money. Okay, so this is uh, of. Okay, alludes to, to, to money. Uh, when you read Proverbs 23, verse 5, says, you know, you cast your eyes upon it, meaning the wealth, and it vanishes. It's just like the bird flies. You know, you can do whatever you want in life, get billions, millions of dollars and everything. But at the end, money flies. You cannot take that with you anyway, beyond the grave, right? So the word, the word hataif, cast your eyes, is related to off. Uh, also, this word off has a numerical value of 156, which is the same as uh, mamun hat. Mamoncha. Mamoncha means your money. The emphasis in uh, basically the, the ha, you know, which is uh, the mamoncha, in your money means that the problem with money is when a person thinks that it, the money belongs to them, that is their money, right? And remember, money is an a energy that needs to flow. This kind of belief uh, makes a person abandon the creator, and ultimately, this person loses the wealth. And he wonders about in search of food, meaning searching uh, for feeding his soul. This is from Job 15, 23. 
And you can see the person that has more money, they still know satisfies, they want more and more because they know that money cannot fill them because in reality it doesn't belong to them. And they think that acquiring more and more somehow will make them, you know, feel like it's, it's theirs and it's not theirs. You know, if it was there, they would take it uh, after they die, you know, to the grave. And no, it, it stays here, right? It's a physical thing, it's a material thing. They may not be eaten. In other words, do not make use of the right benefit from anything that is uh, materialistic like that. Then it mentions the eagle. The eagle, this is according to Proverbs 23, 5. His will will make wings for itself and like an, and like an eagle, it soars to the heaven. It will disappear. And then it mentions on the kite, you know, uh, Perez. Perez is similar to the word Perez broken up or Perez, uh, Perez broken up or broken up as a verse your kingdom has been broken up this is from Daniel chapter 5 verse 28 a person's wealth would be broken up and scatter and leave his hand and the osprey uh, the word for osprey is uh, as Naya as Naya basically can be read as as or os, nahi, nahi, uh, braceness or unwailing instead of bracelessness, bracelessness. There will be wailing. And this is, um, like it says in Proverbs 18, 23, the wealthy respond with bracing words. The kestrel and the various kind of vultures. The person now wanders from place to place in search of food and they will not even find a tiny mouse. They're so in, inside materialistic thoughts and everything that they don't feel satisfied. They feel hungry all the time. They they don't see an end to that hunger, and they don't understand that the hunger they need they they have actually is not for money. It's not for food. The physical food is spiritual food. Is that they're dying basically spiritually, and. Uh, as Psalm 18, 11 says, he flew away via da and the, and the wings of the wind. The word ha-ha-ya ha, ha, uh, may be read as aye, meaning where where is it, you know, where is it? And the person wanders and search for bread from heaven. Now we're going to go to chapter 11 verse 15 and 19 and here it gets a little more complicated not complicated but more confusing okay every kind of raven and the ostrich the jay and the gull and the various kind of hawk and the screech owl and the cor cormorant and the owl and the bat the starling and the magpie and the stork the various kind of heron the Hupo and the Atlaf, which is an, uh, uh, a bat, basically. So every kind of raven. And this verse, basically, and uh, this is how it starts here, you know, et col. Um, it doesn't start with a vav. You know, it doesn't say, and every kind of raven or anything like that, you know. It doesn't begin with the vav. It doesn't say the et. It says, you know, just et, indicating that this is a new section, new topic, something that has started. And the previously the verse was describing the evil that befalls of, on, on a person that is trying to pursue money, a materialistic thing. Now it describes the evil characteristic of people who pursue these type of things like money. Uh, and, and it doesn't mean that money is bad. It just means that the, the, the people that believe that money, you know, belongs to them and that's all they are here to live for, you know, are the ones that are not behaving properly, right? Because money is neutral, you know? So every kind of raven, okay? Every kind of raven. And that... Um, in Ketuvot 49b... It says that the raven is the cruelest of our birds and has no compassion over it for its own children. So this is what happened to the person. The person becomes cruel and keep everything from them for themselves and even 
giving those who are uh, they don't even give to those who are closest to them including their own children you know then uh, so we were like we got edit the menu now we're gonna go to the to the iana iana is the ostrich it refers to a person whose eye is never satisfied with money and this person basically, you know, the, the, the word for ostrich, which is uh, ya, ya ana, has the same word, uh, the same letters of the word I. So this means, you know, that also, you know, when you add, you know, the, the, for the ha, ya ana, the ostrich, you add two to the word itself, it gives you 142, which is the same. Uh, the same numerical value as the name Bilam, which is Beit, Lamed, Ein, and Mem, Sofit, the final Mem, who was actually, who had a, an evil eye, uh, meaning a person that was stingy and jealous of the, uh, of, of, of what other people have. And the J, the J, Tahmas, is similar to Hamas, theft extortion okay basically a person that looks for money uh, they get corrupted they you know don't guard themselves from these two things theft and extortion and the goal uh shahaf goal has the same numerical value or uh, has the numerical value of 388 which is the same as to the serpent lenahash okay and um a person that just does that, just pursue money, and that's it, is similar to a serpent, you know, and therefore, you know, it's like a person is basically pursuing the dust of the earth. Then the hawk, uh, gnats, hawk is similar to natsot, uh, feathers, is it here, natsot, uh, natsot, feathers, this bird has many feathers, which is uh, it can fly really high and defeat them. So similar to that, you know, your thoughts, your ego can fly so high and defeat you, right? Um, and the same way the person, you know, does not, um, you know, the, this person does not amass wealth in order to use it for good, but rather to dominate others as well. And uh, it's very interesting because this is a symbol of many countries, the eagle, okay, and the hawk. And uh, the screech owl, you know, this is a hoss, uh, screech owl, refers to a type of, uh, let me put it here, so the head, a hoss. Uh, this is a bird that lives in the wastelands and uh, these people that are basically looking all the time for profits, profits on everything, what is good for them, and they put themselves in dangers, uh, and, and, you know, like gambling, other kind of stuff, you know, they put themselves in danger in order to, to, to do that, basically, it's similar to walking in, uh, in, in the desert, uh, just for the search of profit, uh, endlessly, with, uh, without resting even at night, or going, or traveling overseas, risking your life just for profit. You know, basically, you don't care about your life. You care about the profit. Uh, any profit that you get, you know, it's it's worth the risk. And the cor cormorant, the word is uh, hashlach. Uh, it's related to the word mashlichim. The word mashlichim, uh, which means throwing. That people throw themselves into danger all the time. Basically, it's related with the one, uh, with the one above, and the owl. Which is a young shuf is related to the word neshef twilight. Even these people, you know, they just think about that at night when they go to sleep. Okay, and then the bat. Hatin uh, shemet. This is according to Baruch sixty one b. For some people, their money is more precious than their lives. Uh, so the word Tin Shemet Bad can be arranged, uh, arranged as Tet Neshem, implying that 
they will give up their soul, you know, Ted and Hashem, they will give up their soul just to gain uh, money. Then the starling, Ka'at, the starling may be read as Ka'ati, he shall come. In other words, uh, the person described above is one who give up a soul for the sake of money. And they will, will come to violate, you know, the vows of the Torah. And then we continue, you know, with the magpie. The magpie basically, uh, the word Raham contains the same letter as uh, Harem, which is uh, vows and oath. So this person will violate what? The Harem. And then the stork. Uh, that's a Hasid, Hasida. Uh, the stork is related to the word Hasidut, piety, alluding to this person, this is Hasidut here, and the word Hasida, this person actually will come to also violate the laws of piety. And then he continues, various kind of Heron. The sages have thought that uh, Anafa, Heron, and Daya are the same bird, the same Daya implies too much. And the person that has too much, according to Hulin 63, Tamut Hulin 63a, these people, you know, that are always looking for material things and money, they're always angry. Okay, and then the, ho the hoopoe and the atlaf, which is another bat, um, the duhifat, the duhifat or hoopoe is a construction of the word, you know, hoduka foot. Hoduka foot referring to certain certain bird which is hunch over, but this word also means praise and shackle, meaning that these people not only uh, expect to be honored and praised simply because of their statue and uh, the status and wealth, you know, but they also are victims, they're slaves of the money, okay? And that's why it says, you know, the name of the wicked shall rot, according to Proverbs 10.7. Let's go now to chapter 11, verse 22. You may eat this from a modern, the red locust, according to its kind, the yellow locust, according to its kind, the spotted gray locust, according to its kind, and the white locust, according to its kind. In Sohar, volume two, volume two uh, page 144a, uh, the three patricks, and David Hamelech are considered to be the four legs of the divine chariots. And now we're gonna see that this is what it meant in here, okay? So you may eat this from among them. In other words, you may benefit from the merit of these, the patriarchs and David Hamelech, for they will protect you from a harsh decree. All right, so Ed, Ele, Mahem, Tao Hello. Okay, so you may eat from this. And these are the following. The locust, according to its kind. So, the word Arba, Arbe actually, Arbe, red locust, has a numerical value 208, and that is the same numerical value as Yitzach, Yitzach, which is Isaac. Then we're going to see the yellow locust, uh, that is a Sal, la, sal Salam uh, has a numerical value of 200, which is the same as Yaakov Chai. Jacob is alive, okay? Uh, according to Talmud Tanit 5b, Jacob Avinu, Jacob our father, never died. Then the spotted gray locust, uh, the one that is uh, called Hahargol, refers to Abraham. The letters Hahargol, the spotted gray locus, may be arranged to spell the word uh, Hegel Gar. Conversion has begun for, for the stranger, right? As Abraham was the first to believe that Hashem as God, uh, or Hashem was God over all mankind, therefore, you know, this spotted gray locus, adding one for the word itself, has a medical value 248 which is the same as the name Abraham, 
okay, which protect the Jewish people, the people of Israel, and the convert as well, okay. Then the white locus according to its kind, you know, this is the Hagav, white locus, adding one for the word itself has a numerical value of 14, which is the same numerical value of the name David, okay, so this is what this uh, locust actually uh, means, the kosher insects uh, we are supposed to uh, keep in mind that they're insects and there's a lot not to eat insects however these are permitted and there's a reason for it because they have root in Kedusha okay now so to finish, we're going to finish uh, with Ramchal, and we're going to talk about the following. The world that we live has basically different ways of seeing things, and it has different paths. And these paths, some of them lead to true, the other ones lead to falsehood. And for those of us who study the Torah, we must be... Uh, feel privileged that we are basically in one of the paths that leads to the truth. And uh, that's what the Creator gave us, the Torah. And He gave us the Torah, and this is why it says, you know, in Tehillim, Psalm 25, verse 8, Good and upright is Hashem, therefore directs, which is uh, Yod Vav, Resh Hey, that's the name of the creator, but uh, meaning directs the sinner on path. The word Torah is from the same root as the word Yore, uh, because the Torah directs man down to the proper path and prevents him from faltering. And the person that disregards the Torah lacks that direction. They go everywhere, they, and, and sometimes they don't even know where they're going. And it's hard for them to find the path of truth. And uh, this is why the Torah, uh, different than the, the other paths, the Torah, when it gives a commandment, it starts with the word Torah. It's explicitly, you know, start with that word. Uh, it's teaching us the following, that we are going to be guided to the path of truth. And any other path will be a path of falsehood. It might sound truth, you know, and uh, you'll find out there a lot of people teaching Kabbalah according to Hermeticism, Kabbalah according to other uh, things, and, and they're not really leading to the path of truth. They're just taking here and there and adding it in order to uh, kind of like, um, like kind of like to make sure you know that it fits their narrative, right? But if you really go into it, it's all about power. It's all about I know more than you. I have more power than you. Know kind of stuff. That's not spirituality. Spirituality is all about learning how to cleave to the Creator, and we do that by loving each other. You know, and by loving the Creator as well, loving ourselves as well, right? Uh, so, Hashem provides us with the choice of which path we should choose, you know, the path of truth or the path of, uh, of falsehood. So that's why the Torah concludes. This is the Torah of the animals and birds and all living beasts which swarm in the water and the living things which swarm in the land. So they're permitted animals that will basically leads you to the path of truth and we already talked about these animals they're really not only physical animals there's also traits and things that we have to work within ourselves and there are also traits and things and animals out there when we eat things that are not kosher that will lead you to falsehoods will take away your energy and your and help and it will not help you advance spiritually the tuma tries to the best to emulate Kedusha. This will sound like it is holy. And that's why other nations will also write their own covenants, their own Torah. 
and they have books containing religious guidelines and that kind of stuff but in reality it doesn't lead them with the, to the truth it misleads them to some other place but the torah is direct is direct if you belong to yashar kel that means you're going directly to hell to to god right well this other path requires you to go here there you have you gotta have certain levels you gotta achieve this you gotta ha have a grade or or or, or you know and and that's all superficial philosophical thinking okay Hashem separated between light and darkness kedusha and tuma holy and unholy between bene israel and the nations of the world therefore he gave us specific signs which will distinguish pure foods suitable for the bene israel and the impure foods to be consumed only by the other nations that's why the following Pasuk, Beikra 11, 47 says, and to separate between the impure and pure, and the animals, and the animal which can be eaten and the animals which should not be eaten. In there we see that there's be a redundancy in the Pasuk for impure. In this case refers to animals that cannot be eaten, and the pure refers to animals that can be eaten. Why is there a distinction repeated in here? He's telling us basically in the same way that the Creator distinguishes between pure and impure people, meaning the Nate Israel and the other nations. Also, uh, he also distinguishes between food which is suitable for the pure nation and the food what is that is suitable for the uh, for the impure nations. So and we need to emulate that because we are created Betzalem Elohim, right? And we're not only talking here about pure, impure Israel and the nations. These are Israel basically, or pure is the Kedusha, which is the desire to give, the desire to bestow, the desire to share the light. And then the impure, unholy, the nations, those are the egoistic desires and those are in every single person it doesn't matter if you're jewish or not if you're part of israel or not if you're from the nations or uh, we all have that all humans have these this type of uh, desires this type of egoistic vessels and altruistic vessels within ourselves because we are a microcosm of the macrocosm we are basically created at the image of the system that was created above ourselves okay so keep that in mind that this is what the parsha is all about to distinguish what is good and bad for ourselves and also to connect ourselves with that uh source that we talk about which is bina and bina is all bestowal bina is all, all giving and we need to achieve that by basically um connecting to it by working in these traits. And this is what we're doing during the count of the Omer. Going to each of these midat, you know, and and, and, and correcting all the midot, the, all the midot that are inside each of these sefirah, uh, or sefirot. And that's how we reach, you know, the 49th level and eventually the 50th gate, okay? So let me finish with this. Uh, from Rabbi Yaakov Buhaseira. May their merits stand for us, meaning the merits of uh, of the people of Israel. May their merits stand for us in all times of trouble and distress to nullify all harsh and evil decrees from upon us. Amen, and may be his will. So Shalom, it will be until the next uh, weekly Torah portion, which is going to be Saria. So I'll see you until next time. Shabbat Shalom.